Good morning, everyone. The Victoria Arts Council respectfully acknowledges the Lekwungen speaking people within whose traditional territory we operate, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic First Nations, whose historical relationships with this land and diverse cultural heritage continue to this day. We raise our hands in gratitude for the ancestors, matriarchs, hereditary leaders, and of course, the artists from these lands. We give thanks for the privilege of living and working here. So good morning, my name is Kagan McFadden, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome us all to another Creative Morning, the last one of 2022. It's gonna be a special one. And uh, we've got a new face, so many new faces today, but uh, a new face, my new colleague, Laura Dutton. So Laura is now uh, a co-lead with me of Creative Mornings Victoria, as well as the newly minted uh, Director of Community Programs with the Victoria Arts Council. And if I didn't say so, I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Arts Council. <laughs> uh, so take it away, Laura. Thank you, Kagan. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here today. So I've got some slides to go through with you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay, yep. great. Okay, welcome to Creative Mornings. December's theme is abundance. Gratitude magnifies our experience of abundance. When we marvel at the taste of ripe summer fruit, juice bursting from its skin, when we set a table, a seat for every person we cherish and bathe in the radiance. Generosity multiplies abundance. When we prioritize mutual flourishing over private stockpiling, plant ecologist Robert Wall Kimmerer posits, the practice for dealing with abundance is to give it away. Once you stop hoarding what you fear to lose, you find the more you share, the richer in community and well-being you become. Our Santa Fe chapter chose this month's exploration of abundance. Nabina Chick Southall illustrated the theme and MailChimp is presenting the theme. Thank you to MailChimp, Creative Morning's official global partner for marketing. If you're a freelancer, this is for you. Whether you started freelancing business yesterday or years ago, our global partner MailChimp has got you covered this month with a new article specifically geared towards helping you overcome fear, doubts, and the very real imposter syndrome that can get in the way of reaching your goals and growing your business. Check out the link on the website, the Creative Mornings website. Did you know that the number one way for people to learn about Creative Mornings is through their friends? We invite you to bring a friend. Whether they've never heard of Creative Mornings or just need a push from a friend to join on Fridays, get them to tag along. We're closing out this year. We've got a cool uh, request and opportunity for you. Today through December 18th, which is just a couple days away, Creative Mornings is conducting a 2022 survey and we'd love to hear from you. Give us your thoughts in 20 minutes of your time and be entered to win a Sonos One. Thanks for contributing your wisdom to help make Creative Mornings the best it can be. You can participate in the survey by finding the link on the Creative Mornings website. Thank you to the City of Victoria and the CRD for their continued support. And thank you to HCMA. HCMA is an architecture firm that designs buildings, brands, and shared experiences that connect people. So we are from the Victoria Arts Council, and we'd like to share our current exhibition, Little Gems, our annual members holiday show and sale. The exhibition includes over 60 artists, and there are over 100 works on display at our main gallery at 1800 Store Street. Come by to support local artists and check out the show, which closes on Sunday, so it runs till December 18th. The Victoria Arts Council is thrilled to have recently unveiled a new public art billboard at 1800 Store Street. The untitled work by Victoria's Ingrid Mosquita is an illustration of identity that leaves the audience with a curiosity to uncover more. With funds from the City of Victoria's participatory budgeting campaign and in partnership with STEPS Public Art, the VAC convened a selection panel of arts professionals, artists, curators, and community leaders who chose Mosquita's proposal from a dozen others submitted. Kagan said, we designed this opportunity specifically to provide a platform for artists who are racialized from Indigenous backgrounds or who identify as a person of colour as a way of addressing historical prejudice and systemic barriers to access within equity deserving communities. And we're honoured to be working with Ingrid Mosquita in such a huge way. 
The Victoria Arts Council seeks submissions from artists for our next issue of Until Magazine with the theme New Traditions. For Until Issue 14, we would like to examine our long-standing relationship with our personal as well as sociocultural traditions and possibly see them in a new way. We welcome all original artworks inspired by an inquiry into new traditions and new ways of finding and expressing belonging to where you are. Until 14 new traditions will be guest edited by Desiree Leal. Submission guidelines can be found on the VAC website. The deadline to submit is January 15th and the issue will go live on March 1st. I'll now turn it over to Kagan who will introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Laura. Great job. <laughs> so uh, it's my privilege to welcome and introduce Robert Joseph Green to Creative Mornings. Uh, Robert focused his career, uh, pardon me, his writing career to teach gay men about bravery, chivalry, and selfless romantic acts. Green's This High School Has Closets was long listed nominee for the Lambda Literary Award in 2020, 2012, uh, young adult novels category. In 2015, Green was a finalist for the Vancouver Pride Legacy Turquoise Award for the Arts. He graduated from the Ecole Privée Charles Peguet in Aix-en-Provence, Aix Provence, France, and University of San Francisco with a minor in Western European culture and literature. Green credits his writing talent to his mother, who was an English teacher, and to his father, who was the president and CEO of Green Bark Press, a publishing company. So without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Robert. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kagan, Laura, and the Victoria Arts Council for this opportunity. I, I was really excited about this. This, this one piece has uh, generated a lot of global interest. And, and uh, you know, as I explained, it took it took me and, and uh, Catherine by surprise, uh, given what the other pieces were. So um, I wanted, I'm not the artist. Catherine Adamson is the artist of this piece you see here. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you about how it came about and and what sort of materials are uh, she used for this, but a lot of interesting background story to this. So this art piece is one of seven pieces that were supposed to be part of a collaborative uh, effort that was going to go on an art exhibition throughout the United States entitled Authentic, A Study in Evil. And what it was, um, we were looking at key um, artifacts that uh, I had collected from various dictators, um, looking at their touch on humanity versus their touch in any creative uh, essence of day-to-day -day life. And how that came about in, in an ironic story is um, I remember talking to a friend about Christmas. So it's kind of ironic that we're around Christmas talking about this. And uh, his family came from uh, a Slavic culture. And he said, you know, well, Christmas trees were forced upon our, you know, our culture um, during the, you know, German occupation or Prussian occupation way back then. It wasn't really part of uh, our culture. And I looked everywhere online for that. And I couldn't find any reference to that happening. Um, but I did talk to a psychologist and uh, they referred me to what is called the Little Albert Experiment, which is, um, and I actually saw it in a movie as well, where something can, trig can trigger someone's mind of past trauma. So, you know, be it the coin that we're going to talk about or be it, um, you know, the schwash sticker from Adolf Hitler. These are, you know, very simplistic symbolisms that have greater stories behind it that affect people um, individually. Um, and in our terms with the art collection, Authentic, A Study in Evil, it was more um, looking at these artifacts from the trauma that it, it created. So uh, we had seven uh, uh, dictators, Pontius Pilate, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, Idi Amin and George W. Bush as the uh, examples that we were using in the art collection. During the time that we were doing this, Donald Trump was in office. So everyone was asking us, why didn't you do one on Donald Trump? And it was like, because we want to give him the opportunity to see this and change, you know, to right his wrong. So um, that's kind of why 
uh, we did not include uh, Donald Trump uh, in part of this because at the making of this, we were hoping maybe he, you know, he would improve or be influenced um, to do better. Uh, so now we're going to start with uh, the coin itself because there's a really funny background story of how we got the coin. Um, up until 1961, there was no proof that Pontius Pilate actually existed other than scripture, Bibles, and historical references, but we had no tangible proof except the coin, and that's the coin that you see there. Um, Laura, do you want to put the coin up uh, so that everyone can see the coin? So this is actually... Um, these are actually prutas, they're not shekels. Um, and why the art piece is called shekels, because when I bought the coin, I was told it was a shekel, but when we actually got it, it was a pruta. A pruta is a low denomination coin during uh, Judaic times um, when Pontius Pilate was ruling. Now, to give you the value of what exactly a pruta is worth, it takes 10 pruta back then uh, to buy a loaf of bread. So that's the value of what a pruda is. Now, this pruda is the insignia with the staff there. Um, and that is the only proof that Pontius Pilate existed until 1961, when they found a theater uh, with his dedication uh, in the corner. So when you buy coins, um, there is a coin dealership in Israel. But when you buy the coin, you, you have to fill out a form to the Israel Antiquities Authority. And um, I, I and my, you know, being naive, just filled it out as is. And, um, you know, the purpose of the coin was not a collection. It was to be used in an art piece. And the Israel Antiquities Authority did not like that answer. So they actually rejected my initial uh, application. And that sort of didn't sit well with me. And it didn't sit well because I felt that, you know, if you're a collector and you put it in your book, it's just going to sit there in your book on a shelf. Whereas if we use it in an art piece, thousands of people are going to see it. But they didn't care. They rejected it. So I actually had a friend named Brian who um, uh, is a, is a he has a collection, uh, uh, a coin shop and collect a collector shop here in Vancouver. And I said, Brian, um, could you get this coin for me? And he's like, oh, sure. So he did the application, but the Israel Antiquities Authority, they were really smart. They put one and one together saying, you know, are you buying this for someone else? Who are you buying it for? They knew it was me. So Brian came back saying, look, tell you what we're gonna do. <laughs> Cause I, I'm on your side on this. Um, and uh, he had a coin dealer friend in Australia. So uh, what we did was we had um, the Australian coin shop buy it, send it to Brian, and then Brian sent it to me. And that's how I got it. But I'm pretty sure my name is all over the, the warning list for the Israel Antiquities Authority. Don't sell him anything. <laughs> because, um, But in fairness, and I did explain this to them, was the coin is actually set and mounted on a resin that will not damage the coin. And if needed, we can dissolve the resin. So, you know, if this coin is needed for any other utility, but I mean, this coin is thousands of years old. Um, you know, it, it served its life. Um, it is an artifact and it's an artifact that is cherished and, and applied. So that is the, the, the funny story of the Pruta of uh, how we got that. Now, we put all this together, we're ready to go on art tour, and then COVID happened. So COVID hit us and we were like, ugh. Um, so all the exhibitions were canceled. Luckily, and I really do mean luckily, um, Metzger's always kept in the back of their mind that we had this piece and they really, really wanted it for their collections. And for those who don't know, Metzger's Museum uh, is in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And if you haven't been to Abbotsford, I highly suggest you come. It's in between Vancouver and uh, the border with the US. They actually have their own airport. You could fly right in here. Um, 
but it's it's a free museum and it's worth coming to. And uh, my shout out to the Abbotsford News for keeping the stories going on us, um, as well as to um, the city and the tourism department. Uh, they know that this piece draws a lot of people and they've been keeping the stories going about this piece. So I, I really, really uh, thank them for doing that. So let's get into the piece itself, okay? Catherine used a piece of plywood as the background, which she coated with two coats of white paint. And if you see, um, can we see the piece that well, or how are we doing? Would you like me to screen share the, the image of the piece? Sure. There we go. Okay. So this type of cross is called a glory cross. And um, the glory cross uh, signifies the, de the departure of the divine. And I'm going to get into a minute, why did we choose Pontius Pilate for this? But um, I, I really want to get into the details of the piece because the piece is really, really significant to the storyline of what we were trying to portray here. As you know, Pontius Pilate uh, was the ruling governor uh, in Judea uh, under Tiberius uh, uh, over the Jewish people. And he was brutal. He was disrespectful. He was brutal. Um, but the good part about uh, me presenting this is that we have two sources of information about Pontius Pilate, one being the religious aspect, but one being the non-religious aspect, which uh, comes from historians during that time. So as each piece that we did, I did an accompanying essay explaining why we chose the dictators uh, within the context of our exhibition. And so this is the only piece that actually has two essays. One essay is from the religious aspects of why I felt this piece was significant under authentic a study in evil. And then a non-religious aspect saying, look, even outside of the Bible, he was a brutal dictator. He was abusive. He did many bad things. And, and he was recalled so that people um, from, you know, universally, be it religious or non-religious, can understand our position on choosing Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate um, erroneously is um, accused of condemning Jesus Christ to death through crucifixion. The truth of the matter is he was under pressure by the um, the Jewish tribunal, the Hebrew uh, Jewish tribunal to convict Pont uh, Jesus Christ. He really didn't feel Jesus Christ um, did the wrongdoings that he was accused of, but he was like, you know what, I'm, I, this is a popular opinion amongst the people, so I'm just going to let it happen, is basically um, the what the scripture says. But, you know, with that said, um, he, he he did it, okay? And and that's that's what the issue is. Um, so he did it by crucifixion. And, and that's the other part about what this piece is. If you look, that, that is supposed to be a cross. And as I told you, we did a glory cross, but the cross signifies crucifixion. And crucifixion was the, uh, a regional torture punishment um, that uh, they did during the Roman times uh, to kill off people that they wanted to put to death, be it political, be it, you know, um, to kill people from war, uh, be it through a judiciary process. There were people um, executed by crucifixion. And I say this is regional. It didn't originate from uh, Romans. It actually started... Uh, probably from the Phoenicians who brought it to Alexander the Great, who carried it on. It was standardized by the Persians in the sixth century so that we know that at least the Mediterranean had crucifixion. Did it go beyond there? Probably not. Uh, historians have said that, you know, like in Egypt, crucifixions were unheard of. They would uh, put people through, um, they would impale people. So impaling 
was the, the primal uh, way of torturing people to death. But there's an added element to crucifixion that very few people don't know is it's an agonizing, slow death. But there was also this embarrassment. And the embarrassment was you were not allowed to bury the body. The body was required to rot and be picked apart by animals or whatever on the cross. And that's a part that people miss about this is that there were two aspects. Yes, there was the torture, but these were high, you know, very family focused uh, groups, uh, especially uh, in the Jewish culture, family is very important to them. So to have this embarrassment of having a loved one left publicly to rot uh, really spoke volumes about the type of torture Romans were trying to inflict on people. And um, ironically, uh, I wrote a story many, many years ago, a love story, and this was reminded to me, um, and it was um, called The Love of Phaleron and Ibsen, and it took place in Greece uh, when they were a vassal of uh, Rome. So this is long after Greece had its era, but Rome was in the era. And they were two young men, they fell in love. One wanted to go to the riches and went to Rome. The other one trailed behind him and became a soldier. And the one that came for the riches of Rome married a, a very wealthy man. Um, the man died and he was mourning him and his, his first love saw him who was a so soldier in the, and he saw him at the grave of his lover um, and the soldier, he was stationed to the cross to the crucified bodies. And so he went down to console his first love. Someone stole a body and the, the soldier realized that he was gonna be put to death for allowing a body to be stole and buried. So they took the body of his deceased lover and put it up on the cross so that they could be free. And then they went off and lived happily ever after. It was a love story. Um, I actually forgot I did that story. It was actually reminded of me. But what we know about uh, you know, the crucifixion and about uh, the wealth of Judea at the time is that uh, it was a very prosperous time. And it was a very uh, functional time there. And we wanted to really encapsulate some messages uh, in the duality of this picture. So there's a lot of dualities in this in this in this uh, piece that Catherine Addison did: um, Christian versus non-Christian, um, life and afterlife, uh, beginnings and endings, empowerment and subjugated. You know, so there we had um, a lot of um, storylines in there. But if you look at the bottom, at the very bottom of the crucifixion, you see specks of wood. Those specks of wood are actually from an olive tree from Israel. And um, what they found out was that the, crucif the wood that they used um, in crucifixion uh, sometimes was olive wood. And how they found that out was they, they did find one body that was stolen and buried and that was from Jeho Hanan. Um, and he was uh, 24 to 28 years old. He was entombed in the wealthy part of Jerusalem. So we think his family paid a bribe maybe to take the body down to be buried. But when the archaeologists found the body, they found that he had been crucified and that there was a nail in his ankle bone and actually Metzger's has a replication of that piece uh, in their museum next to this exhibition. And the ankle bone had shards of olive wood. So that's why we know that the crucifixion had olive wood. Now, if you see the encirclement of, uh, of um, color coming from the cross going in a circle, you see that there is red that is supposed to be the blood of Christ. Catherine Addison actually used her own blood and created her own uh, tincture of, of paint to make that red in the painting. And the rest is tea leaf gold. And the message that we were trying to send is, you know, even with all the wealth, even with all the gold that you have, you are st still human. And, you know, you still have a life. And you have, and this is the strong thing about abundance is 
reality, you have everything and you have nothing um, because you can't take it with you. And um, that's why, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we always hear about this. We start from the ground and we go back to the ground was sort of the message that we we're sending. And I had to find a biblical quote that matched that. And the biblical quote um, that I found was in is, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter one, verse six, uh, which talks about um, the wind blows to the south and turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever turning on its course. And this is um, part of what they call the wisdom scriptures. And in the wisdom scriptures, this is someone that's talking about life and the questions of life. Um, and, you know, chasing after good things and ending up with nothing uh, is basically what the, the lesson of that story is. And that's why we thought it was fitting. But the also, the, the, the mo more important part is <clears throat> this was the one verse that was basically unadulterated in 44 versions of the Bible. Um, there's 44 versions in the English Bible. This is the one that is unadulterated through all of them. So the last question is, um, why, why Pontius Pilate? From the religious viewpoint, and I got a lot of publicity from this from uh, biblical scholars, is I took the position that no one talked about, which was, did Pontius Pilate reintroduce evil into the world from the you know Jew uh, from the Christian viewpoint? Jesus Christ came here, the Son of God, to help bring goodness to the earth and to show us the way. His journey was interrupted by this one event where Pontius Pilate put him to death. So he was doing good; he was doing a good job, and then kaput. You know, Pontius Pilate's like, "I condemn you to death." And the teachings is all we have left. Uh, so that is why we felt from a religious viewpoint, Pontius Pilate was, um, you know, our choice. The second part, the non-religious point is that we had enough uh, information. Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jewish historian during that time, he was in Egypt, but he was advising uh, uh, the embassy in, in, in Judea saying, look, you can't do this. You can't put images to Jews and Jewish uh, cities of emperors, of gods, because they don't like that. It's against their principles. And that's what you know Pontius Pilate did. He's like, I'm going to do it anyway. They revolted. He suppressed them, and it got really bad. And then um, the, the, the emperor Tiberius called him back, uh, saying, look, you're, you're causing too much trouble. So that's basically um, what I had in this presentation for this. I want to close with uh, talking about Katherine Adamson, who's one of, she's my female bestie. We're very, very close. She's an amazing artist. This is a uh, commission piece. This is not what she typically does. And I encourage everyone to go to katherineadamson.com to see her art. It's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful art pieces, uh, artworks I see. I really do love them, but she is a trooper. She is a person that, you know, um, ha had an abusive marriage, you know, left an abusive marriage, had a cancer scare, lost her daughter, um, you know, to a physician error. And then she pioneered, um, you know, getting the rights of the uh, physician error to justice. And so she's she's done such an amazing job in, in this world that I always think that she's such a good soul. And I feel so grateful to um, you know be a part of her. Uh, in closing, I just want you to let you know, Metzger's has this art piece on loan from Catherine. The art piece is actually on sale and they are trying to find a donor. They are a not-for-profit organization. Um, so whoever makes the donation for the piece will get a tax receipt. Um, please see Kagan if anyone has any inquiries about that. He'll relay it to me, which I'll relay to Catherine Adamson. Um, I really think, you know, she she really hopes the sale will go through because I think she she really wants to have something to leave to her grandchildren. But this is such a powerful piece that uh, we really, uh, I really support uh, their initiative, the Metzger Museum Initiative, 
to make this a permanent piece. And they will put a plaque in the honor of the donor for the, the entire exhibition, not just this piece. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Robert. That was fantastic. And wow, it's, you know, you're a pro. You did that all in 15 minutes or something like that. And oh, that good. Mine says 25 minutes. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I was sweating that I went overboard. No, no, this is fantastic. And um, those of us new to Creative Mornings, uh, we we save the last 20 minutes or so uh, for questions from our audience or from our friends here. Um, I always like to just get the ball rolling. I, I have been putting things into the chat, including the Metzger Collection uh, link, as well as Catherine Adam, Adamson's link. So okay. people can go and visit those websites as well uh, quite easily. Um, I'm just so curious because I'm also a writer and, uh, and spurred by research. And it sounds like you had to do a lot of research around uh, this, this project. Mm -hmm. And what does research look like to you? Um, it, it takes on various forms. Uh, for this one, um, I relied very heavily upon, um, I went to the University of San Francisco, which is a private Jesuit school. Um, they do have a religious studies course there, and I uh, interacted with uh, some of the professors there to get that information, more so in writing my essay. And what was interesting was, um, you know, the the Catholic Church, they have a love hate relationship with me. Um, you know, I, I wrote the Forbidden Scrolls, which uh, was from Lucian of Samosata, which was on the index of forbidden reading for Catholics, but it's 2,500 years old. So I thought, what would be a big deal about that? They did not like that. <laughs> However, this essay, when we did the press release, we asked for uh, biblical scholars to give us feedback. Uh, Father Martin uh, was um, a Jesuit priest who gave me feedback, who said, you know, it's a refreshing angle that, you know, that this was, and actually suggested that Cardinal Sarah in Rome uh, be sent the article uh, because he studied Pontius Pilate. And uh, so when I sent it to them, they promised uh, a response, but we never got one. We did get a few responses back. Most of them were more supportive of, uh, you know, there was a blogger, a, a Protestant biblical blogger who said, you know, yes, I do feel that, um, you know, Pontius Pilate, that's a good point, reintroduced evil into the world uh, through this, you know, condemning Jesus Christ to death. Uh, that's, a, that's a unique angle to, to go forth with. Um, so we, we didn't really get a lot of negative feedback except from one biblical scholar out of India who said, you're an amateur, you don't know what you're talking about, um, you know, which, yes, I am not a biblical scholar, but I'm giving a point of view that is unique. I don't, you don't necessarily, or at least I don't believe you have to have X, Y, and Z credentials to come back with an opinion. And, uh, you know, I still stand behind that. So maybe out of the 10 reviews, I got one bad one. <laughs> Good question though. Anyone else? Yes. I, um, <laughs> I had to laugh when you said, you don't have the credentials, you're the amateur. And, and what went through my mind is like, yeah, and the church is doing well being, <laughs> you know really well these days being in the hold of umpteen academics and stuff so we uh, my one of the focuses of my practice is to look at sacred text and read it through a creative non-academic non was non, still with intelligence mm -hmm. so I was really interested and I loved your presentation I just thought um, you're not coming from a particularly religious point of view, but you're, you know, we're getting, we're getting a story from a fresh perspective. Yes, yes. You know, so um, one, I was a bit curious, just, you know, from a nerdy point of view, when you said the scripture from the Ecclesiastes was the only unadulterated one, and I was, 
I'm curious, did you mean, like when you talked about 44 versions of the Bible, like there's um, there's so many translations and ways you can sort of just translate a word, but thankfully in the Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, the word's still integrous. So I noticed that depending on your point of view, depending on your cultural background or whatever, you tweak the the interpretation without actually messing with the original words but you know like um okay i'm going to dive in like in in paul's writings that are translated as homosexuality these days mm -hmm. prior mm -hmm. to world war ii they were they were translated as masturbation Right. 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 <laughs> so you actually. You know, so yeah. So what? What would you mean by that? Is it just the? I'm really glad you put that question forward because again, I'm a writer, right? And why did I say versions versus translation? And you hit it right on the nail, right on the head, which was translations are literal um, interpretations from one language to another. It's a, a lateral move versions question the intent that the outcome message doesn't necessarily on a trans on a version that the uh, the message doesn't necessarily correlate um to the fixed answer of the original context so if you're in the king james bible for example and you want to address divorce you're going to write the king james bible because remember he wanted divorce you're going to write the King's James Bible in the context where divorce is supported. So you could take that same translation and put it in, into a version where the outcome of the person processing that information is different. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I had to find a story that fit the art piece, but could be interpreted universally to everyone that reads it. So if someone has the, you know, the, uh, the King James version, or someone has the Ethiopian version of the English Bible, uh, this verse is pretty, uh, pretty much in line where everyone's walking away with the same interpretation of that verse, uh, versus there were some that I really, really, really liked. But when I went to see how the interpretations were in other Bibles, they wouldn't match. People walk away with, why did Rob, you know, use that quote, or why did Rob and Catherine use that quote in the art piece um, when it's not, uh, uh, you know, fitting from that version of that particular Bible? Mm. Um, and I also think it, it will resonate with a broader audience, broader audience because, you know, you know, things do come full circle you know life the circle of life is what everyone knows about and so i think in this piece um there's a glimmer of hope you know uh and and that's why i i really like this and maybe that's why this piece out of all the pieces and i if i was to hedge my bets i would have thought the adolf hitler piece would have resonated because we had the schwa sticker on rosenthal plates so a common plate that everyone eats China and when you know the Nazis came into power they're like okay you have to put the schwa sticker on everything I thought that was a powerful piece I thought the China piece was a powerful piece but I I can understand why this really resonates with um you know the public uh, and why it was picked up internationally it was covered by arts media in the states in Europe um you know, why this piece is, is really nice. And I really think it was really smart for Kagan to do it around Christmas time. Uh, but, you know, uh, the other thing is Metzger said, you know, this this piece pulls in the, the, the crowds. And, and I can understand why, because everyone wants to see a coin around the time of Jesus Christ, you know? So I, I see why the curiosity of this piece is there. But great question, because I love when, you know, I have a writer's question, then I can give you a writer's answer to it. So thank you so much for that question. Any other questions? And did I answer your question to your satisfaction? I yes. Say. yes. Oh, good. Yes. good. Any other questions?
I'm I'm going to follow up with a another question uh, because I was very drawn to the quote, and I'm I really appreciate not only that you um, unpacked it in such a way, but actually the way that you introduced Conscious Pilot and and his position, according to the research, um, which was that he was not actually interested in putting this man to death uh, or you know. Um, torturing him in such a way, but mm -hmm. actually was influenced by uh, Tiberius and the other kind of powers around him to do so. And so when you said that first, and then we saw the, the quote, and I, I interpreted, you know, the wind as actually the influence. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not too sure if anyone else is picking up on that or not. Um, but the way that, you know, uh, yeah, the way that influence uh, uh, takes takes control socially, culturally, religious, uh, religiously, <laughs> um, and how uh, how uh, the the people behind those decisions are actually maybe less in charge than they think. Exactly that 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 you hit again. Well, we got a really smart audience here. Think about the time of when we did this. Um, this is the time when Donald Trump was in power. Um, that we knew that the South. Uh, is primarily Republican. Um, the North is primarily Democrat. And there was, again, we're looking at duology and messages. And, you know, Kagan, I, I was really touched that you saw that. Um, to Americans, at least, um, there's a hidden message there. But to everyone, there's a hidden message about politics. You know, um, you know right now, which is troubling my heart, uh, you know, Russia has invaded Ukraine and has just caused devastation among humanity. And again, we're looking at everyone's waiting for Putin to die and have a regime change. And again, this quote will always be in effect um, on, you know, hu human existence of how conservative, liberal, you know, um, things go with the with the changing of the wind. So yes, exactly. You 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 saw that, and I was very touched that you saw that. Great. Uh, well, don't be shy. And also, if you are a little camera shy, please feel free to put any questions in the chat. Or and, you can type uh, out a question if you have a yeah, question. You can relay them. Or it's all live, so Robert will see it uh, as you type too. Uh, but while we're waiting for people to to maybe think of other questions, I'm so curious because also I'm a curator. Uh, that what the rest of this exhibition looks like. So you mentioned um, the from Pontius Pilate all the way to George W. Bush and all these uh, these dictators in between. Uh, so is it a different artist is attached to each dictator or is it more uh, material culture like the coin, like the Rosenthal plate? Um, right. what, uh, what can we expect from if we want to visit a show of this? Um... Well, the show is going to be broken up as the pieces are sold individually now, not as a collection, which is sad. It was an awesome exhibition. Catherine did all of the pieces except one. Uh, like I said, uh, Jasmine, too, uh, had, uh, she was a student from Emily Carr, and she wanted to do the Chinese ex uh, piece uh, based on her personal family history. And it's a beautiful piece and it has such a strong, powerful message. And that's where, you know, the messaging on all of the pieces were so powerful. With Mao Zedong, um, it was a citizenship medal. Um, so your allegiance to the Communist Party uh, on what you did and, and uh, to, you know, uh, ingratiate yourself to the regime, um, you got awarded this medal. But this medal had a duality again, where you're looking at um, at the expense of whom. They got this medal at the expense of whom was the question. And that when some people saw that medal, they thought traitor, not person to you know feel honored of. So I mean, there, there's uh, that exhibition, Pol Pot. We had stamps from Pol Pot, but we also had his French Communist Manifesto which gave him his ideas for governing or dictating, um, which were brutal, absolutely brutal. Um, Idi Amin, we had the currency, uh, and that's kind of interesting because Idi Amin 
was very pro-African and wanted the imagery of Africans on coins. And at the time there was colonialism and, you know, Queen Elizabeth was on these coins and he had this hatred of having, you know, a non-African on uh, currency. Uh, and he tortured in a lot of non-Africans, you know, so this imagery of the of Idi Amin uh, on currency, again, uh, it could be traumatic for people. So all the pieces were, were truly amazing. And, you know, it, it really broke my heart because we had so much fun in discovering everything about this exhibition um, that it didn't come to fruition, you know, but the fallout of that is each piece is uh, individually getting its own attention in its own right. And for that, I'm very proud and honored to be part of that team. Great, thank you so much for um, explaining that a bit further. Gives, no I think it gives a good context to uh, to the work on display as well. Yes, Laura, hey, Laura. don't forget to mute or unmute. Okay. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you were telling the story about how you acquired the the coin and what it took to get to get this artifact. Do you? do you know how many of these are still in existence where they are like I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that you know the process of acquiring an artifact like this um I was told um and this is not an official number but during the the discord I was having um there's less than 3,000 of these uh shekels uh in circulation so, um, but it's not what's in circulation, it's the quality of the, the coin that's in circu circulation. So this was a good quality coin. Um, there are other coins and the, the quality of them due to oxidation, doing degradation with time, um, that they're not uh, sort of, uh, you know, they really, there's a few good, quality pieces with the good imagery on them. I own an Antonius coin. Um, if you don't know about Antonius, he was the lover of Hadrian who died in the Nile at the age of 19. And those are one of the rarest coins to get. And I got one, but the quality of the coin is rather low. The image is barely there, but there's so few coins with the Antonius uh, insignia. Uh, when Antonius died, Hadrian was so heartbroken um, that he declared uh, Antonius a god and had everyone do coinage in his, uh, his uh, imagery One of the, and art and statues. And some of the most beautiful Roman statues are actually of Antonius, uh, Hadrian's lover. And where's the number one most perfect Roman statue of Hadrian Antonius? The Vatican. They have the most perfect version of Antonius. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> Thank you. That was fascinating. I saw a question come up. Uh, Kagan, there was a question about talking again. I can't remember. Cornelia, could you mention again the name associated with the objects and the traumas? Okay. So it's not that these pieces are directly affected. Like I didn't get reports saying this person's traumatized by this image, but it's the imagery that we're using as examples to show trauma. So with Pontius Pilate, we use the coin. Adolf Hitler, we use the Rosenthal plates uh, with swastikas on them. And, and the point was everyday common items that we see could be just innocent, but could also equate to something traumatic. So that was the, the link between those two. Joseph Stalin was a plaque. Pol Pot was his stamps in his French Communist Manifesto. Uh, manifesto, excuse me. Uh, Mao Zedong was the citizenship medal. Idi Amin was the currency, and George W. Bush was his autograph on his campaign sticker. Um, I thought you mentioned that 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 tied in with sort of like a theory or someone who had presented that as a um, I don't know with theory is the right word. Dad, well, somebody I, yeah. Was I started out with, I had a friend who's from a Slavic culture and I always thought a Christmas tree was, you know, a wonderful representation of Christmas, 
but he told me about trauma to his culture when the Prussians or the Russians back in the day occupied his country and said, you have to have Christmas trees in your home. And I never would have thought that a Christmas tree could bring such trauma to people, um, you know, because that's not the purpose of the tree. So that's what sparked my, these are everyday things that we take for granted, but my, you know, and I remembered there was a movie where there was this little girl, and I wish I could find the movie. I didn't do the you know, research in time to, to find this. And the little girl came and saw a doll and just freaked out. And for some reason, she was abused with that doll being present uh, from that household. And I wish I remembered that movie. So again, it was showing everyday common items that people would take for granted, but there was a link that it's linked to something deeper, darker, or more sinister evil. And, and so there was a theory though that you did reference someone saying that it has to do with memory and actually filling in the gaps. And who was the theorist? Um, it was a psychologist. The, the experiment was called the Little Albert Experiment. So if you Google the Little Albert Experiment, it talks about um, linking symbolisms with experiences, both positive and negative. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Great. Yeah, I think that's what Cordelia was like was angling for was the little Albert experiment. So we'll all oh, I'm so sorry. have a terrible oh, time. Oh no, but the other information <laughs> was great too. Yeah. <laughs> like that was that was a bonus. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So you got when I had trouble trying to find out uh this Christmas tree story, I asked a psychologist friend and he pointed me to the little Albert experiment. Nice. And so we've got just about five minutes left before the hour is up. Uh, Rob, I always like to um, ask our guests, what else, what are you working on these days? What's next? What can we expect after uh, after this? Well, I did uh, sign an option uh, on a screenplay for The Blue Door, which is ironic because that's the love, the Russian love story where the czar who wanted to be popular uh, with his people said, my three sons can marry whoever they shoot the arrow into the door of. Um, and they never, the czar never thought one of his sons would choose another man. And uh, it's a beautiful story. Sadly, that was the story that the Russian government through their media used as justification for passing their first national anti-gay propaganda law saying, you know, look at this foreigner, look at Robert Joseph Green. He's trying to influence our children with this, these innocent stories, you know, and, and, and I was so nauseated by that. Um, and the irony is I don't have, I, my books are translating to eight languages. Russian's not one of them. I let, I allowed a gay.ru to translate it. Um, I allowed activists to translate it. And then to, to my shock, an activist was actually arrested in front of a children's library reading my story. Now, never in a million years would I have thought my innocent love story could bring so much trauma to someone and to get arrested. These are harmless stories. So I, I, I'm very baffled by that. And then, um, so that was picked up uh, by a uh, company uh, to make, we're hoping to make the first family Christmas gay themed animation special for Christmas with that story. So hopefully, and then I have a screenplay right. that's gone to the BBC, but as you know, with the death of Queen Elizabeth, everything's been put on hold until the coronation of King Charles. So hopefully they'll move forward with one of the stage plays that I wrote. Amazing. Yeah, thank well, you. We feel so uh, lucky to have hosted you for this last hour. And, I feel so honored. <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's it's amazing. We do so much here at the Arts Council. We do we're primarily exhibitions, but we have a magazine. We do this monthly lecture series and all kinds of things to support artists. And uh, every once in a while, I think, who are we going to show next? And then someone like Rob calls up and he says, "I have an idea for you. We've never ever met, but," <laughs> and then I say, "Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how about you talk in December on the theme of abundance?" And oh my God, look how great that worked out. So yeah, everything aligns so perfectly. <laughs> I thank you. I'm very honored, and I think artists are honored to have these sort of opportunities. Uh, so very grateful. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much again, Rob. And uh, the next Creative Morning is going to be on the theme of Sanctuary. So that's a nice kind of play back-to-back uh, -back of Abundance versus Sanctuary, especially with the way that we, through Rob, have uh, animated Abundance. So uh, it'll be the last Friday of January 2023. Uh, and uh, it looks like Nikki Rendell will be speaking about a gallery that she's been curating in a chapel here in Victoria. So um, so that's uh, that's going to be a very uh, dynamic presentation as well, I think. So if you aren't already logged on or um, uh, a member of Creative Mornings, please uh, jump through those hoops and be a member. And uh, it's free to sign up and you'll get uh, just a reminder uh, with each uh, post of an uh, upcoming lecture. So without all that, uh, I wish everyone happy holidays. Stay safe. Happy holidays. And thank you very much, Rob. Laura is going to... Um, do a, a light edit of this video and then it'll be posted later today if not sometime this weekend and then it could be circulated for free and will be archived on the website for as long as the website is around <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much thanks everyone Bye.